This is Jeff Dice, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast, and we are continuing our walkthrough of the book itself, Human Action, Mises' magnum opus, and we have been working our way through part four of that book, which is very long and which uh, <coughs> commands more than one one-hour podcast at any rate. So today we are working through uh, chapters 18, 19, and 20 in part four, which is a little more than 100 pages. And th- these are rock solid core pages. I mean, especially chapter 20. I was telling Joe Salerno offline that I would wish we could get our politicians and central bankers to just read the 50 pages in chapter 20, and they would have a much better understanding of what's going on today in markets and why what the Fed is doing can't work. Uh, so, all that said, as I alluded to, our guest is Dr. Joe Salerno. We're all sort of on lockdown here in Auburn, Alabama. But You know, for those of you who uh, we've whipped into shape and gotten reading this book, in a sense, with everything going on in the world, it feels a little counterintuitive to go read some 900-page tome, some treatise, when, you know, the news seems so ephemeral and we have to keep up on what's going on with this terrible virus and what our government's doing to us. But really, counterintuitive or not, this is an excellent time, I'm going to argue once again, for getting back to first principles, getting back to original understandings, to going back and looking at some of the masters, the great masters from the past, whether that's an art or literature or history or economics, because a a lot of their wisdom would serve us quite well now. And Mises is certainly in that category. And so we've been highlighting as we go through the book, not only some of his passages, which are particularly applicable to what's going on today. I mean, it's just amazing. Sometimes you can pull a sentence or a paragraph and it absolutely perfectly describes what's happening, but also his language. Mises, the stylist, it's really, I mean, this is a gentleman who's, who's later in life. He's writing this in the 1940s. He's writing this in English, a second language upon his arrival in New York City. So it's really a, a tour de force and a pleasure. Uh, you know, you, you think that a, a 900-page economics treatise is not necessarily the most pleasurable thing to read, and it isn't in parts. We, you know, there's no reason to, to uh, you know, say that it is, but nonetheless, there are, you can get an extreme amount of satisfaction out of just grappling with Mises and also enjoying Mises the stylist and Mises the genius. So you spend some time inside his head when you read this book. So all that said, Dr. Joe Salerno, it is great to talk to you from your bunker this morning. Yes, I'm, ha- I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to, to be talking to other adults. Uh, it's, it's, it's great. <laughs> well, I'm struck first and foremost as we get into chapter 18, which is titled Action and the Passing of Time. This, this whole chapter is about time. It's about the temporal element of economics. It is about time preference. And Joe, the first thing that struck me is I went back and checked, but there's the discussion and treatment here of time preference is really uh, uh, much expanded. You don't find this in the theory of money and credit. No. In fact, um, I don't think Mises had fully developed his time preference theory in the theory of money and credit. He was a student of Bombavarks, and Bombavark sort of mixed in psychological considerations uh, when talking about interest rather than just the, that of purely action. Right. And he actually has this little blurb on page 485 for those of you who are reading the Scholar's Edition, where he, he credits Jevons and Bob Verberg with, you know, the first to completely solve, uh, you know, the uh, some of the fallacies and the productivity theories, the labor theory of value and that sort of thing for coming up with the idea of marginal utility. But he does mention that uh, that he doesn't agree with von Baerbeck's treatment completely. And if you go back and look, there's actually a footnote to that effect in the theory of money and credit where he says that I accept the terminology and method of attack of von Baerbeck's theory of interest, but he doesn't necessarily accept it because interest is a big part of, of what we're talking about here. So when, when he says that time preference is a categorical requisite of human action, does that mean it's an axiom? I mean, what, give, give us your quick and dirty definition of time preference. Uh, time preference is the fact that people prefer their satisfactions uh, as soon as possible. That is that a satisfaction available tomorrow is, is much more valuable, um, much more uh, amenable to, to, to people than one that's available uh, a year from now. Uh, and, and, and the reason for that is that time is scarce. 
we ha- we are defective human beings, meaning that we lack a lot of things that we would like to have. So um, given that, you can only get one thing at a time. You can only um, produce one satisfaction at a time. So if you really thought about it, um, even if you were in a Garden of Eden where everything, Audis, laptops, grew on trees, there would still be a scarcity of time if you had one body. There would still be time preference. You would still have to do things one at a time. So um, I thought more about this. I mean, the only way you can get rid of time preference is to try to imagine a world, which is really inconceivable, of a, where you can clone yourself an infinite number of times so that you can satisfy yourselves with, with having a birthday party, with driving an Audi, with doing all these things at once that satisfy all of the unfulfilled wants that you have. But, you know, today you hear a lot of these themes. There's a lot of crazy people out there saying that we are in an era of post-scarcity, that we're going to achieve some sort of singularity. And then there are the transhumanists out there who probably think that we could sort of have uh, enjoy more than one thing at once. And it's, it's, I think some of these crazy ideas are, are leading us to think that there's, Joe, some new economics out there available to us. Well, again, there, there, there's scarcity in the world. Uh, if we were beings like God, God-like beings, where we were never um, dissatisfied with anything, we wouldn't act. The very fact that human beings undertake means, use means to, to achieve ends, and continually do that as long as they're conscious and awake, implies scarcity. So the very fact, for example, that these people who believe in a post-scarcity world are talking to you and trying to convince you implies that they're dissatisfied with the fact that you hold the different view and that they're trying to to, to assuage their dissatisfaction. <laughs> well, maybe I should go get an Audi. I think there's zero <laughs> interest rates or something. I, just, I should just have one because they're sitting there idle on the Audi dealership's lot, and here I am without one. This seems unfair to me, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, the, he, he has a lengthy treatment in this chapter about capital, and, and so uh, rereading parts of it last night, I just jotted down here that capital goods by definition invoke time because you're not immediately consuming them. So the fact that we even have capital in society requires an understanding of time. And he has this wonderful sentence where he says, you know, all of our material wealth is, is a residuum of past activities. And I thought that's such a great refutation of, the, of presentism. People who think that the, the past is retrograde and dumb and doesn't matter. People who don't want to accept that all the wonderful material wealth that's around us here in the West is, you know, is something – we're standing on the shoulders of previous generations and we owe them something for that. I thought that sentence was a magnificent. You know, absolutely. Um, in, in fact, somewhere else he points out that the wealth that we have today, you can trace that back. Now, economically, you don't have to do that because businessmen don't care about where the wealth came from. But just from an historical point of view, you can trace it back to to people when they realize that, hey, instead of instead of fishing, I'm going to cut back on the number of fish I eat just by catching them by hand and spend some of that time building a net. So the fact that they built the net and became more productive allowed them then to build an axe and cut down a tree and, and, and build a home. And so that this progress in, in building up capital goes back to the to, to primitive times. And we stand on their shoulders, as, as you said. And we take it for granted, too, in which we're seeing yes, today. Yes, we take it completely for granted, yes. Now, capital is, you know, it invokes time, but it's also contra, I think, a, a caricature on the left in our political world. The capital is transient. You're always either accumulating or consuming it. it. It's not fixed and finite, and it doesn't just rest in certain hands forever and ever. That's true. It's um, I'd like to say, and I think this might come from Mises or Rothbard, that capital is a way station in the production of consumer goods. See, capital isn't independently productive. It's just, for example, the net is a way station on, on the way to producing fish for the next year before the net wears out. The net eventually is completely transformed into fish and is the, in that sense used up. The same thing is true with huge fa- factories that are equipped with robots. Those things aren't fixed. Those things aren't there forever. Those things are used up. They're worn out. 
in producing the automobiles. So in effect, those are the automobiles in a half, they're a half-baked cake. So a full cake is, is, is a consumer's good, and the robots and the uh, um, factory and, and so on, the other equipment, those are simply half-baked cakes. They're eventually going to be completely transformed into the, the cars that we use. So all of these capital goods as opposed to consumer or lower order goods, all these involve time, all these involve some uncertainty and risk. What, what does all this mean for our lay audience? What is what is the length of the structure of production and why should we care about that? Uh, well, the, well, there's there's a couple of ways to answer that. But, but one, uh, the point that you touched on, it's very important, is that once you invest – funds and, and resources, labor and materials in producing a particular type of machine or factory, um, that becomes what we call inconvertible. Uh, um, you have now sunk all of these things into the production of a particular type of good. You may be able to change a factory slightly. For example, you could, instead of cars, you could, prevent, you could produce ventilators. But for the most part, you've committed yourself to uh, the production of a particular type of good. Now, that good is going to be produced over time. It's good, you know that factory will last ten or twenty years or forty years, and so you, the the entrepreneur, is speculating that the um, prices that consumers are willing to pay will cover not only the materials but also the the cost that was sunk a long time ago, ten years prior, in that factory, and so that's. One of the um, uh, the the functions, most most important functions of entrepreneurs, that is to appraise, to estimate what the future will be like, what people will demand, and what you know what type of technology we'll have in the future. Yeah, it, it strikes me that you know those of us who are interested in precious metals. I mean, if we look at the gold mining industry, <laughs> what a horrible industry to be in because mm -hmm. not only do you got to figure out where the gold is. You got to deal with the local government and buy the property and the mining rights. Then you got to bring in all this physical equipment and, and literally wrest it out of the ground. And then you have to process it and get it to market. And all of this takes years and years and years. And the, in the meanwhile, the per ounce price of gold is fluctuating like crazy. I mean, what, why does anybody mine gold, I guess is the question. Oh, it's the same reason that, that people will produce anything for the future. Uh, and that is, uh, in a modern industrial economy, entrepreneurs are willing to risk their destinies, as Mises says, their their fortunes to uh, to adjust production to what they think will be more urgent demands of consumers. In other words, they're gap fillers. They see that something's going to be missing in the future, uh, and that and, and or be very very scarce in the future, and therefore command a high price. So they're willing to take the risk of, of, of investing today in resources that will take a long time to, for, to form in, in, into the final consumer's good a year from now, five years from now. Look, an automobile, from the time it goes fr fr from the conception of, uh, on the drawing board to the dealer's floor, is, uh, it used to take a U.S. company seven years. A Japanese companies cut that to five or four years. So you're looking at markets and people's desires and wants that are four, five, seven years down the road. Yeah, that's really amazing how complex all of this is. And we, and again, I, you know, if people get nothing else out of this book, it, it ought to be a sense of gratitude for the material world we live in, which is not just mere consumerism by any stretch. Now, you mentioned this idea of convertibility. Presumably, uh, an individual or a business initially uh, gets savings or profit in the form of cash, and then they convert them into some sort of higher order capital good. And as you mentioned, once once it's converted into something, a uh, production line for uh, a Cadillac SUVs, for example, Cadillac Escalades can't ne can't uh, be converted into a production line for ventilators because all of a sudden there's a virus. Uh, but but Mises points out that there is is a an out for this for entrepreneurs in this in the sense that they're stock markets and stock markets give us the opportunity to have some limited convertibility of capital goods and some tradeability of them. Yes, so uh, it allows a, what I, what we call a mobility of the investor. The investor can get out of that line. Now he can get out of that line profitably or without making any sort of loss if there are other people out there that think that these capital goods can still um, command prices that that will g return a profit. Um, however, 
if most people see that that this this good is not going to be successful on the market, then the only way you can get out is at a loss. But 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 as you said, there there, there is that chance of mobility. Mobility. Now, what that does, of course, is allow um, or make it more appealing for people to invest in these inconvertible capital goods because they know that they can get out maybe with a loss, but they can still still get out. Mm -hmm. Right, because otherwise you've got a factory assembly line that you can't convert into anything, and it's you know you're not going to barter it <laughs> for something else. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting is at p page five eighteen, Mises has some interesting lines about cash, and what we're seeing today is you know cash holdings by businesses and individuals have been irrational in a sense over the last ten years because interest rates have been very very low, and holding cash in a money market or a CD or some sort of business checking account has, relative to inflation, has probably been a losing proposition. Uh, and so it has, in, in that sense, not been rational. Uh, cash has been unproductive, which is what a lot of people uh, like to argue. But nonetheless, now we're finding that companies with large cash balance sheets might be in a position to weather this storm. And uh, Mises points this out. And th this this uh, you know goes to a, a concept that uh, William Hutt and others e elaborated upon, the yield for money held. But uh, Mises says here, in recent years, economists have paid special attention to the role cash play holding plays in the process of saving and capital accumulation. Many fallacious conclusions have been advanced about this role. And he says, hey, look, if you're holding uh, cash to purchase factors of production, well, that's converted into capital. And if you're just holding it because you think it's the most advantageous mode for you at the moment, well, that that causes a you know otherwise a fall in commodity prices and it and it still serves the market so this idea that you're somehow a bad person or you're being dumb and unproductive by holding cash is really being laid bare in this horrible crisis we find ourselves in yeah yeah so mises i think there is referring to keynes um, and before him, the monetary cranks that he took his inspiration from, like uh, Silvio Jessel and Major Douglas. But in any case, um, what Keynes said was that if people stop spending on consumption and hold that money, then um, that discourages production of consumer goods. And since you're, you're discouraging the production of consumer goods, you're also discouraging the production of capital goods. And so workers are being laid off. So Mises is saying that's completely false. In fact, what's happening is if people take want to hold some of their income in cash instead of spending it on consumer goods, well, that doesn't change the amount of capital goods. They have cut back on the amount of consumer goods they're producing, uh, they're, they're buying. They're, they're purchasing fewer automobiles. They're, they're, they're buying fewer fancy restaurant meals and so on. That allows the workers in those industries to become available to produce the uh, capital goods. So even though these people aren't investing in capital goods, the prices of those capital goods are going down because they're, they're holding money, not spending it. And other entrepreneurs then are investing in those capital goods and are that act of, of you and me not consuming and just holding the money. Even that is productive in the sense that it, it frees up workers and, and other materials and electricity and other things that can be converted to, to production of capital goods. It frees that up to produce more capital goods and make us more prosperous in the future. So it's a very important point that Mises is making there. But let's say over the last few years, even if someone is losing a couple points a year to inflation in a money market, let's say, I mean, what about the psychic or psychological element that they just, they just derive uh, comfort, let's say, from having a bunch of cash and, and that might come in handy? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, at, at, at very, very low interest rates, um, you may want to you may want to take that small loss that uh, in in real purchasing power because there's a little bit of inf inflation for peace of mind because remember the, the the primary reason for holding cash is that the future is uncertain you'll never know when there'll be a medical emergency you'll never know when when there'll be a certain sales opportunity that you want to take advantage of <clears throat> if everyone knew the future perfectly. Then everyone would invest, and, and meaning that they know when their income will will arrive, at what, on exactly what dates, and when they'll be need to ex to spend money exactly on what on those dates. Then they would just lend the money uh, until those dates, and no one would want to hold cash. Everybody would want to lend their money out until they needed to spend it. So um, it's it's purely uncertainty at the bottom 
uh, fundamentally that that causes cash holding. So in chapter 18, he establishes this whole concept of time preference and why we, you know, uh, axiomatically understand that we we prefer our dream house at age 40 (laughs) rather than age 90 uh, because of time and uncertainty. And then in chapter 19, which is called the rate of interest, he applies time preference and gives us this concept of originary interest. So uh, there's a lot of different kinds of interest out there in terminology and economics. People use all these other, all these ideas. Uh, but, but to me, as someone who's interested in, as a lay person in, in learning Austrian economics, originary interest is really a baseline concept. Would you agree? And give us, give us the definition. Yeah, so what, what Mises uh, calls originary interest is where, where does interest fundamentally originate from? It doesn't uh, originate from um, people borrowing and lending money. It's, it's even more fundamental than that. Um, it, it originates from the fact that people prefer uh, a sum of money today to the exact same sum of money, let's say, a year from now. So in other words, even though um, I'm, I'm from New Jersey and I have a, a name that ends in a vowel, let's assume you completely trusted me uh, to pay back a, a loan of $10,000. So I asked you for $10,000 for one year. Um, w- w- would you loan me the money? Even even knowing I'll, I'll pay you back and I would have the resources to. Of course you wouldn't. And the reason is that $10,000 today is worth more than $10,000 in the future. So I would have to bribe you to get you to, to lend me that money. I would have to offer you, let's say, $11,000 in the future. And the reason is that that a dollar today is worth, let's say, on average to you and other people, $1.10 in the future. So that ratio of prices, that 10 percent discount on a dollar a year from now, so that you have to give eleven dollars back to me uh, or I have to give eleven dollars back to you to get you to give me 10 today. That is originary interest, that difference in value between dollars available at different dates. Um, Now, that that term is not used by any other economist. Rothbard even changed the term to natural. That's the natural Mm. interest rate. Okay. That's what naturally arises from. Okay. So uh, sometimes we sloppily refer to interest rates as prices. But what he's saying here is that they're a ratio, a present to future want satisfaction. So they're a signal in a sense, but they're not a price. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. They are not a price. Now, they appear as a price on the loan market, but the loan market, you know, if you go and borrow for a mortgage or if you go uh, and take out a business loan, um, the interest rate you pay there um, is determined by supply and demand, but not not independently. It, it, it's tied into how what, what the rate of return is in a business, and that rate of return is is the originary interest rate. So in other words, if, if I expect to make – 12% on a business investment, and I want to borrow from you, then I would pay you up to 12%. I'd pay you less than that because I expect 12%. And um, so I would try to pay you as, as little as possible. Let, but let's say then that that becomes most most businesses will will pay 10%. Uh, that, and that's, that, that's what we think of as the price, as the interest rate. Okay. And, and, and it is in one it, it, it's it's sort of summed up in one figure, 10 percent. But Mises wants us to remember, even though it, it, it seems like it's a price, it really is a ratio of prices. Yes. And I think we should remember here that he's working from Bamberwerk's uh, work on interest rates because this was a huge sea change in how we understand what interest is and why it arises. I mean, it's not income from capital. It's not the price you pay to use capital, and it's certainly not what the Marxists think, which is, well, the wealthy guys have all the capital and they hoard it, and then they charge us poor people to access it. Um, and I'm curious, I haven't heard, you know, the, you, when, when you accept the Marxist definition of interest rates, how do you explain negative interest rates? How do you explain, how, how is it exploitative to effectively pay people to borrow money? I, I'm not sure that that works. But but my point here is that this is this is a fundamentally different way of looking at interest relative to uh, classical economists. Yeah, it absolutely is. And, and, and here's the difference. Um, Mises locates interest rates in people's differences uh, in their values between the present and the future. 
the fact, again, that, that you can't have everything at once, that you're always dissatisfied, m- meaning that you have time preference. You'd rather have things sooner than later. So he locates it in, in, the, in this, the, the, this um, difference that people see uh, in, a, in, in the period after the satisfaction versus the period before the satisfaction. So that's very subjective. Now, the, what the um, classical economists and, and even the neoclassical economists who came later, what they see it as is, is a return to capital. That is, that capital is productive, that it produces 10 percent more value. If, if, if you buy a machine for $100, well, it'll produce goods worth $110 a year from now because it's productive. But Mises says, no, that's, that's, not, that's not the case. Well, let's say I invest uh, uh, $10,000 in a machine today, and I know that they'll, uh, it'll produce, um, let's say, uh, hats th- that I can sell for a total of $11,000 a, a year from now. The point is, if you don't have time preference, why wouldn't I bid the price of the machine up to $11,000? If the machine can produce goods worth $11,000, then the price should be $11,000. The reason why it's not $11,000 is precisely because people prefer the income in the present. They realize that, hey, I'm laying out 10,000 today, and because of time preference, in order to do that, I have to, I have, to um, have the prospect of getting more in the future. So, so the question that Bon Baverk asked and that really revolutionized interest theory was simply this. If, if something is going to produce goods worth, um, let's say, $11,000, why isn't the price of that thing today $11,000? Why is it less? And the only reason it's less is because of time preference. So what would a world without interest look like? In other words, some people say that in the in the Islamic tradition, for example, uh, you're not allowed to charge interest. Uh, and now, that's not entirely true. Obviously, there are plenty of banks charging interest in the, uh, in the Islamic world today. But uh, I mean, we don't, again, you know, in a previous episode, Per Bielen was talking about how just cost accounting and applying money prices to, to things to give us a sense of profit and loss and, and make that more concrete in our minds was an invention on par with the wheel, which was a pretty amazing statement yeah. if you think about it. So, but what, what would a world without interest look like? I mean, it's, it's actually something, it's actually something that we need to understand in, in human or civilizational terms. Let me let me give you two examples. So uh, let's say tomorrow you saw uh, a um, a headline that said meteor to strike Earth and wipe out most of human life uh, in six months from now. Let's ask what would happen to the interest rates. Well, no one would people would stop thinking about the future. No one would want to loan money and, and many people would want to live better now. Um, so interest rates would shoot up to thousands of percent. On the other hand, what if, what if that same headline tomorrow in the same newspaper, instead of saying that, said, scientists find fountain of youth that will extend human life to 300 years. In that case, people would start thinking more about the future. People would start saving more, and interest rates would drop towards zero. They'd never be zero, but they drop towards zero. So an extension of human life would, is one factor. Um, if everyone became much more mature and worried about the future instead of, of, of knuckling under to this whole idea that we all have to be in debt and enjoy ourselves today, you would have a fall in interest rates. Hmm. So, um, that, you know, so interest rates, look, they can never disappear, but they change even over the same person's life. So when you're a, ch- a child, when I used to bring my son to a diner that had video games in the front, he would want he would want to immediately play the play the video games for waiting online. I tell him, no, I'm not. I, I, you can't play the video game now. But after we eat, I'll allow you to play two two times, uh, which is you know a hundred percent for an hour, which is millions of percent per year. But he would refuse. I mean, he'd want to play now. So <laughs> and, and so through the life and and by the way, as you get older and, and you start having families and responsibilities. Your time preference goes down, and and that would cause a downward pressure on interest rates. But as people become older, what do we often say when they, you know, in their seventies, eighties, we often say they're having a second childhood because they're going out and buying things that they would have never bought before. They're going on cruises and so on, and so their their time preference is going up again. 
they, they're much more interested in the present because they have fewer years um, remaining. Well, we've seen, obviously, this has been uh, speculated in the U.S., but we see uh, in the European sovereign debt market that there are so-called negative interest rates. Doesn't, doesn't this chapter by Mises, because of time preference, imply that negative interest rates would not uh, exist on just a pure market? Well, yes, it wouldn't exist on a pure market, but, but you have to realize what's going on there. And part of it is that, look, if, if Mises does point out there's something called plain saving. OK, if we got if we got a lot of, of, of consumer goods, we would pile up some of those consumer goods and wait for the future, even though that can of let's say cans of soup and, and tuna fish and so on, um, even though those things. Uh, would not multiply, would not re return us interest. So people do do save for the future when they're afraid that the future is going to be um, have more scarcity than than the present. Okay. So what's happening, I think, with with, with um, these negative interest rates is that uh, because people are fearful of of the uncertain, let's say, uh, about what the future holds. They're willing to hold these things that are as good as cash, which are basically government securities. And, 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 and since cash does have a cost to holding, storing it in, in um, uh, vaults and so on, uh, and there are vaults of private companies that have rented bunkers um, that were military bunkers in Switzerland in World War II. They've rented them from the government, and they have vaults in there and people putting their cash in there. But they charge you. So people are willing to pay a quarter of a percent or a half a percent to hold a government bond, which is as good as cash, and it avoids the charge of vaults and the, and the inconveniences and so on. So I'm not convinced that it's a, that, that is a pure interest rate, a negative interest rate. To me, that's really a cost of, of holding cash in a different way. Right. So that's basically a custodial fee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly right. Right. That's what negative interest rates are. Uh, you're locking in your losses. Uh, and of course, there's other elements here with, with respect to government bonds and um, even corporate bonds, which are negative, which is that maybe they're looking to sell the underlying bond and maybe they think interest rates are going to drop even more. So there's other speculative plays other than just losing money. You might be looking to sell, you know, right. obtain a capital gain on the underlying asset itself. But so there's all this uncertainty. We don't know where interest rates are going. And there's this idea of a ratio where, uh, let's say from the lender's perspective, the entrepreneur's perspective, a private equity fund, you're saying, well, I got to figure uh, the, the, the ratio of, of the value of the amount of money available to me today versus the expected value of, of it at a later date. And I have to charge interest on that. But as Mises uh, points out in the latter part of this chapter here, there's a, an element of entrepreneurial speculation to that, right? Because economic conditions are always changing, which may mean the interest rate you agreed on was either too high or too low in hindsight. And you can also have a borrower who goes bust. Uh, so, you know, the in, in, you know, what you actually charge as a market interest rate also has to bake in uh, some, some money to pay for that speculation. Absolutely right. So Mises points out that the originary interest rate is the pure underlying interest rate. And that's the real interest rate, the real um, rate, uh, originary ratio. But there are other components. And one other component, as you point out, is the fact that when you lend to a productive enterprise, to a business, the entrepreneur that runs that business is, is certainly taking a risk. And you realize that, that, there, that this business is risky. And you don't know everything about the entrepreneur. You don't know. You have a feeling that he's going to be good at what he does. Otherwise, you wouldn't lend it to him. But there is an element of risk. And that's reflected in a, you know, a percentage point or two or, or higher on, on the, the rate to, at which you lend to that person. So, for example, if you're lending, if you're buying a bond from a company that makes bread, which is something that's always in demand, it's unlikely that, that people will lose their taste for bread and the demand will, will fall. There's a very, only a very small entrepreneurial component. But if you're lending to someone who's going to make a Hollywood movie, and we know that about 98% of them don't make money, only 2% do, then there'll be a very high entrepreneurial component on uh, the bond you buy from the, the movie company or, or, or the loan you make to them. So um, that's, that's very important. Uh, so what Mises is trying to point out is that even as a lender, you're an entrepreneur. 
Um, even though you're not directly involved in decision making for the business, um, your money is at risk. You are, I think Mises says, you're virtually a co-owner of the business. Right. And a lot of people are probably getting refinance offers in their mailbox right now. I know I am on their per, on their mortgages. And there's an example here where they'll give you a lower rate for a 10-year mortgage than they will for a 30. So in, in fixed rate, I should say. So there's there's a little less speculation involved in a, oh, exactly. in a decade yes. over three decades. Um, you know, I worry about this stuff, Joe, because as you drive around Auburn, there are skyscrapers every – excuse me, cranes everywhere. Mm-hmm. There's uh, hundreds and thousands of new condominiums, fancy new condominiums being built in our bucolic little college town of 75,000 people. And the workers are still out there during the shutdown right now. They're still out there. And that, that makes one suspect that at least the next uh, level of lending for the, the project is still in place and that they're operating and the workers are being paid and the, the thing's going up. But, um, you know, and talk about entrepreneurial speculation, what if – uh, colleges don't return to normal in the fall, and what if there's you know tons of finished but unsold units? And imagine all the 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 risk in that, and imagine how the uh, the interest rate plays into all of that. Yeah, uh, well, of course, the the, the fact that interest rates the, the they, they've driven you know the, the some basic part of the interest rate down to zero um, that does stimulate the, this excess borrowing and this production of these. These buildings that may never be occupied, and what that—that's a tremendous waste to society. Um, or, or they may be um, occupied ten years from now, but in the meantime, those capital goods, the labor, the cement, and so on, could have gone to producing other things that consumers consider to, to more urgent, more valuable. So there's tremendous waste in those seeing those cranes and those half-finished buildings. And I'm, you know, I'm sure, given that the, the Fed has beaten down interest rates so much. They've definitely distorted entrepreneurial decision making and and diverted uh, very valuable resources into lines that are not going to pay off. And and we as consumers are going to have to pay for that <laughs> in in terms of a lower standard of living. Well, let me just say that these uh, student condominiums, which are being built all around Auburn, are somewhat nicer than my own college living experience. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Some of the accoutrements involved, uh, the swimming pools, the uh, Starbucks in the lobby, the gyms, uh, all that sort of thing. But, you, you know, you talk about distortions, and that leads us into Chapter 20, which is called Interest, Credit Expansion, and the Trade Cycle. And this uh, is a very succinct 50-odd pages that explains Austrian business cycle theory probably as well as any source does. And fr- from this uh, section of the book, we get the concept of malinvestment to which you just alluded. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so malinvestment is uh, – uh, the way Mises uses the term is an investment – in wrong things. I mean, that's what mal means, bad. It's a, it's a bad investment. Um, it's often been said that the Austrian theory of the business cycle, which Mises formulated initially and then Hayek helped develop, um, is it, it's often called the theory of overinvestment, that, that too much has been invested. But that's not the case at all. Um, there's no extra funds to invest. There's no extra saving. Um, this was These funds for investment were created out of thin air. And what and so what they've done is caused resources, There's only a certain amount of resources that, that, that can be invested since people haven't changed the amount they're consuming. Those resources are the same amount that was that existed before the injection of the new money. Those things, some of those things are inve- are, are now used to invest in the wrong things. They're bad investments. So so we're throwing literally throwing away some of our wealth. And that's where the word malinvestment, which I think is a very important word and a very important way of describing the Austrian business cycle theory, that's where that comes into play. And that's really a central theme in Austrian business cycle theory. Well, what's his goal here at the beginning of the chapter when he talks about money's never neutral? We don't have uh, what we call the er evenly rotating economy. And because it's never neutral, there's no neutral interest rate per se. What, why, why would we concern ourselves with this? That is a very important point because um, economists, uh, economics as it has developed, monetary economics, um, since the end of the 19th century, um, the main theory is that of the quantity theory. And there's a germ of truth in that quantity theory. But where it goes wrong 
is that it, it tells us that, look, if, if there's a, a, an increase in the money supply, an increase of 10 percent in the money supply, well, prices are going to adjust pretty quickly and uh, they'll increase by 10 percent. All prices will increase by 10 percent and they'll increase at the same time at the same rate. Um, so Mises was very concerned to point out that this is not the way uh, the prices adjust to a change in the money supply in the real world. In the real world, first of all, not everyone is given an extra amount of money, like twelve hundred dollars that, that they'll be sending us. In fact, in the real world, the money goes um, into the credit market. Uh, that is, you know, banks get more reserves and they they make loans to specific businesses, and those businesses then begin to buy certain things, invest in certain things, and drive those prices up. And the workers that they hire with that extra money then begin to spend money, let's say, on um, going to Disney World and driving the price of, 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 of hotel rooms and so on in Florida up. Uh, and then and then other people, other workers may, may spend that money on on uh, going, to, you know, to, to out to fancy restaurants. And so the prices of, of fancy meals go up. But other things haven't gone up. So as I tell my students, my MBA students, when I was teaching in, at, at Pace University in New York, um, money starts to trickle throughout the economy. But being a college professor, you know, my, my, my salary is raised every year or, or every two years. And so it, it's not until all of that money begins to trickle back into New York, maybe because people are going to Broadway shows now um, after a year or two of that new money being in the economy. And other people are, are buying financial services. So eventually, the demand for MBA degrees at my university, Pace University, goes up. So it's only two years later that I get the new money. And so during those two years, there's been a redistribution of real income and wealth away from me. who have, I had to pay higher prices for steak, for cars, for, for beer for two years um, with the same money income. Um, it's only later on that I catch up. So what me the importance of all this to the business cycle is that when businesses first spend money, they drive the prices of factories up, of, of raw materials, of equipment, and that attracts um, investment away from producing consumer goods to producing the factories and, and, and electricity that's needed to produce these various types of equipment and, and other factories. So there's a complete distortion of the economy because of the way money enters the economy. It causes price of some goods to go up before price of other goods, and that causes real resources to shift away from what consumers really want, that is, goods today, they want McDonald's hamburgers today, to goods in the future after these factories are, are, are completed. So when the Fed stops inflating, stops injecting that new money, suddenly interest rates go up, Businesses don't borrow that money. They, ne they never buy the products of these factories, the, the new equipment and so on. And we have the recession and bust. Joe, it strikes me that even if we attempted some technical means of distributing new money neutrally, like literally dropping it out of helicopters, mm -hmm. and somehow magically no one fought over this and everyone got a $100 bill. It, to me, it still wouldn't be neutral because, first of all, $100 is a very different thing for someone who's very poor versus someone who's very wealthy. And also, depending on what you want to buy with it, there are varying degrees of elasticity of demand, right, uh, for right. certain kinds of products. They're not, it's not all the same. Like some products, even if everyone got 100 bucks today, you wouldn't be able to raise the price at all. And some, you know, a six-pack of beer, you might be able to double the price right away. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. I, I often uh, tell my students, look, if you won uh, $10 million in the lottery, would you go out and buy the exact same things you have been buying all along now that you're more wealthy? Of course not. So if you double everybody's cash that they have in their purses, wallets, and, and in their bank accounts, they're not going to spend that doubled amount of cash on the exact same things that they spent the, the, their, their income on prior to, to getting that new wealth. They're going to begin to demand different things, and that's going to change the whole economy. That's going to move resources around. Well, when he talks about the entrepreneurial component and all this, he's got this great line about where, you know, if when we have changes in the economy, which are artificial in a sense because of credit expansion, then the, the market rate of mm -hmm. interest fails to fulfill the function it plays in guiding entrepreneurial decisions. 
So that's a that's I guess malinvestment of a sort. And would would you say I my understanding is that Jerome Powell, for example, has actually used the term, uh, uh, you know, colloquially before. Would you say there are whole classes of economists who dispute malinvestment conceptually? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think that the, the, you know the, the monetarists, for example, would um, dispute malinvestment in the sense that Austrians use it. That is that that. There's um, there's investment that should be going into producing what consumers want, consumers goods, that because it's now in new money's injected through the econ- through the um, credit markets, that it's now being invested in, in more factories that are going to be not, not going to be fully used. They would agree, however, that if the government suddenly began to spend money on um, more milk. And, and more 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 lunches and, and so on for poor people that there will be an increase in the demand for those things um, at the expense of other things and then when the government stopped you would find that suddenly the farmers that was producing those milk for those programs would find that the demand fell and they go out of business they would agree with that but for some reason they can't get into their heads they, they can't conceive of, of the fact that the economy is not only horizontal, meaning many different types of consumer goods, but also it's vertical, that each consumer good is before it can become a consumer good. As I said before, it's a half-baked cake. It's, it's raw materials. It's capital goods that are going into producing those things. And that if you produce too many of those half-baked cakes, there's not going to be enough resources left to finish the cake and turn them into consumer goods. So, so, so they would dispute that, uh, but, 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 but they're contradicting themselves because they agree if the government suddenly starts spending money, you know, bailing out certain businesses and 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 and, and stimulating the, the the production of 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 certain things. Well, yeah, if the government stops stimulating production, if it stops buying all this milk or whatever it's buying, then yeah, there's going to be a, a bust there. But but they don't agree with it when it comes to the uh, the, the whole idea of the business cycle. Now, for our listeners, would you say that Chapter 20 of Human Action represents the best single exposition of Austrian business cycle theory, or do you think it's found elsewhere in Man, Economy, and State or somewhere else? I I think it's the most informative if you've read Man, Economy, and State um, and and you understand the cycle on, 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 on a basic level, I think you, let's say this is the the, uh, the the consummation of of your understanding of the business cycle because every time I read it and I read it in the last few days again I get more out of it. So I, I think it's I think it's the definitive statement. Let's put it put it that way of of Austrian business cycle theory. I I, I still think it stands up um, in, in in that way. Well, that's good news to me because, ladies and gentlemen, that means if you just read this chapter, you'll know more than a lot of economists about what we're talking about. Um, towards the end of this chapter, he he makes a, a point that I think is so important to what we're thinking about now. Where he's talking about booms and busts and what they represent, and he says, you know, all present day governments are fanatically committed to an easy money policy, and that in order to keep the boom going, it's not a one time thing. The credit expansion has to happen repeatedly. But there's this this great uh, idea he's got here, this great conceptual uh, notion that, you know, uh, economic progress actually means improvement in the quality and quantity of products. And so uh, what we're normally talking about, a boom uh, is an increase in the quantity and quality of products. That's what we'd like to think it is anyway, as consumers or as Americans or whatever. We think, well, that's a good, you know, good times. But he says the problem with artificial booms is that you know there's not an increase in investment there's actually an increase in consumption so how how can we ever have a boom when we're not creating or, or a true boom I should say when we're not increasing capital yeah so what well, yeah from the point of view of mainstream macroeconomists most of whom are keynesians um, the, the the a boom consists in, in producing more stuff that we can measure by the GDP. So when real GDP goes up, oh, well, it's, you know, it's great. Well, that th- this same mentality was what made people believe that the Soviet Union was going to catch up in, 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 in productivity in their economy to the U.S. by the 1970s. I think uh, 
uh, or b- rather by by the turn of, of the millennium, by by 2000. So in the 1970s, for example, Paul Samuelson made a famous statement that our economies were converging and that the Soviet Union would be as large an economy as, as the U.S., which was complete a complete falsehood. It was a, it was a joke. Um, but what the Austrians look at is, as you pointed out, is the quantity and the quality. So it's if you're just producing, th- if you're digging holes and filling them in again, that's that's activity. Um, if you're if you're producing uh, dresses as the Soviet Union did that were only one size, large or two size, large and extra large, and, and petite women uh, <laughs> didn't have, or and children didn't really have any clothing uh, uh, that would fit. Um, to them, because it was more stuff, um, even though it wasn't uh, um, didn't appeal to consumer demand, um, you know that that that's a boom. But f- for the Austrian, uh, um, a true a boom, or I, I would rather call it sustainable growth, um, is producing the right things, the things that that best satisfy consumers. And you can only know that through an undistorted price system, where the interest rate tells the truth about how scarce capital is. And how much people prefer the present to the future. Well, the other thing he mentions is that in a, in the course of a deflationary process, there should be a tendency for the market interest rate to rise. And our Fed never lets that happen. We've had several instances, probably, who knows, since 2008, where uh, interest rates were suppressed and not allowed to rise. But in fact... In our current environment, this current shutdown, horrifically deflationary on both the supply and demand side, um, interest rates ought to be allowed to rise. Am I getting that right? Yes. No, you're absolutely right. That's really a key point that he makes. And he uh, makes this more emphatically even than Rothbard. And that is this. Once Once there's been a bust and a recession, people realize how wrong they were entrepreneurs begin to lose faith in themselves. They lose faith in monetary calculation. So with, with, with returns of five or 10%, they're not, they're not going to, to, to begin to reinvest. They're going to hold cash. What, what's going to spur them or stimulate them to, to, to begin to invest again? And, that, and, and that's a rise in the interest rate in the following sense. That's wages falling, prices of raw materials and so on falling in relation to consumer goods. So when the because these are the prices that were bid up too high by that artificial injection of new money. So it's only going to be when 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 people can get a return of 15, 20 or or 25 percent that they're going to start investing again. And then eventually, as their confidence returns, the interest rate can go back down again. And right now I'm talking about the originary interest rate, the interest return that people get on investing in, 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 in businesses or in what we call a structure of production. Well, of course, we live in a political world, not the the uh, perfect world of necessity and economics. And so because of the political world, we have to understand uh, voters and politicians and central bankers. And so uh, he has this interesting uh, passage at the bottom of page 563 where he talks about voters. And he says it's a common phenomenon that the individual in his capacity as a voter virtually contradicts his conduct on the market. Thus, for instance, he may vote for measures which will raise the price of one commodity or of all commodities. Well, as a buyer, he wants to see these prices low. I thought that was really interesting because we, you know, those of us who are Austrian or libertarian minded tend to bitch a lot. Oh, voters don't know what the hell they're doing. They're they're economic illiterates and they vote for all this crazy stuff that Bernie Sanders offers. And if they just understood, they'd vote differently. And and maybe that's true. But nonetheless, in the short term, in the political sense, for politicians and central bankers, inflation works, kind of works for a while. I mean, that I think we have to understand that, it, and and well, yeah. it, it works. I mean, it, it, it's an illusionary effect, but it does work. I mean, it, it does put workers back to work. Now, the, uh, you know, the, the, they're doing the wrong things, they're producing the wrong things, and they're using scarce resources that could be better used elsewhere. But it looks, I mean, a boom is just that. It's a boom in business. So it, 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 it's uh, the unemployment rate does fall. OK, um, you, wages do rise, though later on it turns out that that prices rise also. And therefore, real wages haven't risen or only rose for a little while. So, yeah, um, it, it does work in the in the short run. Uh, pe- people are um, misled and entrepreneurs are misled into believing that things are getting better. Well, 
That wraps it up. You know, ladies and gentlemen, if you get nothing else from these three chapters, it's that we need some long-term thinking in this country, both on the political side and on the economic side. It's what we're facing here is an absolutely unprecedented crisis of time preference. And what's what I've noted of late, uh, which is really interesting to me, is that this is an issue, this sense that the material prosperity we've enjoyed for the last five or 10 years since the crash of 08 is artificial. That's that, you know, we may not agree as to the hows and whys, but that's something that permeates uh, across the ideological spectrum. There are people, left progressives like Nomi Prinz out there writing about this, talking about this. There are sort of right supply siders like Danielle D. Martino Booth who are writing and talking about this. So, this is an opportunity, as ugly as things are out there, for us to be telling a story uh, about what's happening about why the uh, boom was unsustainable and why the bust was inevitable. And we're so grateful to Dr. Joe Salerno for joining us. Uh, Again, I will promote the book. You can read it for free online in HTML format at our site, Mises.org. Just look for Human Action. But also, you can go to our bookstore and enter the code HAPOD, HAPOD for Human Action Podcast, and get a discount on either the beautiful hardcover Scholar's Edition, which we've been using, and also a very inexpensive, uh, tiny print little paperback, which I think is only $5 with the code. So check out the book. You know, Spend some of your free time at home now if you're quarantined or self-quarantined. Uh, to maybe spend a little time with Mises and you'll come out of it on the other end a lot better informed, a lot smarter. And I think you'll really have a sense of personal satisfaction from having read and wrestled with this book because it's, it's, it's a weighty book. Uh, so, Joe, it was great to talk to you. And I just hope that all of our listeners have a great weekend. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.